Hey guys, how's it going today? So this is the second lecture of the semester and we are getting into unit one. And just a FYI, unit one is kind of a little disconjointed when it comes to other units. Um, it's me throwing a lot of information at you to get you up to speed to the scientific language barrier. So basically, you're gonna hear a lot of new terms, you're gonna learn a lot of these concepts that are actually underlying themes of the course, and they're not gonna be that related to each other, it's just me getting you up to speed with how scientists and people studying environmental biology talk and understand the natural world. So today's lecture is gonna focus a lot on geology and plate tectonics. Um, and we'll get into atmospheric uh, chemistry and we'll actually uh, end up talking about some ecological interactions as well, um, as well as physiology. So this is a pretty broad, um, pretty broad lecture covering a lot of topics and I just wanted to give you a heads up that this is how unit one is going to look. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, Today, today's lecture is titled Basic Environmental Concepts, Measurements, and Scales. And this is a picture I took in Costa Rica of this volcano um, that I would hike up um, called Volcan Arinal um, in this region known as Arinal. And it is an active volcano and it's just such a cool place to hike around. Um, because depending on where the lava flowed um, out of the volcano, which slope the, the lava would fall down, you can actually see while you're hiking these patches of forest that have um, different ages. So, for example, one side of this volcano um, had just a recent eruption like within the last 10 years. So it, it killed all the vegetation on that side of the mountain. And then when you're hiking through it, you're only seeing 10 year old growth. Now in another side of this volcano, there hasn't been an eruption in 500 years. There hasn't been a lava flow in that area in 500 years. So all of a sudden you can be walking in a 10 year old rainforest and then you encounter a 500 year old growth rainforest with monkeys and sloths and all these different types of bird, all the mushrooms you can imagine, all the plants you can imagine, really crazy um, scenario. And I love hiking around uh, volcanoes, active volcanoes in tropical regions for this reason, because you get to see all these different aged rainforests. So awesome awesome times in uh, the, the Arinal region in Costa Rica. So this is a nice segue into plate tectonics. So we need to understand these underlying principles of plate tectonics. Plate tectonics are the large scale motion of Earth's lithosphere. So the top layer of um, of rocks and minerals is known as the lithosphere. Um, many people categorize the lithosphere as the crust. So the crust is the most solid upper part of the mantle. Um, so basically underneath the lithosphere we have the asthenosphere and here we have molted rock. So Basically, the lithosphere is floating on a sea of molted rock. Now, the movement of plate tectonics started between 3 and 3.5 billion years ago. So this is when the, the planet um, cooled enough to actually form the lithosphere and have that separate region of magma that it could float on. Um, once the actual earth cooled a bit, then this lithosphere started to float on the asthenosphere and move around 
um, leading to these large-scale movements known as plate tectonics. So we have to know three types of boundaries. Um, all of these obviously have to do with plate tectonics and the movement of plates, and you have to know them. These are red terms. So a convergent boundary is when two plates collide head-on. A great example of this is the Himalayan mountain region. So in the Himalayas, you have the Indian plate smashing into the Asian plate. And this is an ongoing process, meaning that every year, Mount Everest and the rest of the Himalayan mountain range is actually getting taller. Um, with this being said, the Himalayas are the tallest mountain region in the world. You all know Mount Everest is the tallest mountain in the, in the world, and you're looking at a mountain that's 29,000 feet. So the last time I was in a plane, I was actually flying back from Costa Rica, and I looked, because you can look at the data um, on the screens in front of you, and we were flying at one point we were flying at an altitude of 35,000 feet, um, which it's crazy to me that Mount Everest is 29,000 feet at its peak. So just 6,000 feet underneath where my plane was flying is the peak of Mount Everest, which is absolutely wild to me. An example of a divergent boundary is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So on the bottom right section you can see the Atlantic Ocean in between um, Africa and Asia and North and South America and Central America you have the Atlantic Ocean right in that middle region and the Atlantic Ocean is actually begin, uh, is becoming larger every year so these two plates are actually moving apart making the Atlantic Ocean larger right so this is a divergent boundary these plates are diverging a great example of a divergent boundary again is the mid-atlantic ridge a transform boundary is when two plates are actually sliding past each other now if you live in a region um, and guess what we do we actually live on a transform boundary um, Actually, when I was in pre-K, when I graduated pre-K, there was actually an earthquake, which is crazy. Um, but we don't really have many earthquakes, but many regions that do rest upon a transform boundary have the most frequent uh, earthquakes. The San Andreas Fault in California is an excellent example of a transform boundary. So these two plates are sliding past each other, and because of that, you have all this friction, you have all this vibration. Um, when these events happen, you, have some, you can have some large-scale earthquakes. So what do plate tectonics have to do with environmental biology? Well, they have a lot to do with environmental biology, especially over long enough time scales. So let's start with this bottom, uh, this bottom bulletin. They cause large scale disturbances. I was already talking about volcanic activity. Um, obviously when two plates are really active, they can heat up rock and cause eruptions to occur, earthquakes, uh, interact with volcanic eruptions as well so plate tectonics can cause these large-scale disturbances now a term that is uh, where you're gonna hear a decent amount in this course is environmental heterogeneity so heterogeneity is the opposite of something that is homogeneous homogeneity right and versus heterogeneity so you guys have heard the term homogenized, right? I, when I talk about homogenization, I always talk about a condiment, mayonnaise. You either love mayonnaise or you hate mayonnaise. And mayonnaise is uniform, right? It's homogenized. It is 
one thing. There aren't chunks in mayonnaise. If there's chunks in my mayonnaise, I'm freaking out because I don't want chunks in my mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is supposed to be homogenous. Something that is heterogeneous has different things within it, right? So our planet is very um, heterogeneous. There's a lot of heterogeneity on our planet and much of that we can thank uh, geology and plate tectonics because with plates colliding, with different areas that have el uh, different elevation, whether it's mountain peaks or valleys, you're going to have all these different um, abiotic factors. So obviously the higher you go up a mountain, the colder it gets. So there are specific plants that like those cold regions. There are specific animals that like those cold regions that have that specific amount of precipitation. So that's a quick example of um, plate tectonics driving and enhancing environmental heterogeneity. Our planet is not homogenous. There are all these different regions with different abiotic and biotic interactions going on. And we can thank um, plate tectonics for driving much of that geological heterogeneity. Now, this is a really cool example, and we're going to have to learn what uh, species distribution is really briefly. So, the distribution of a species is where an organism lives. So, if you look at a map, and you can see that, for example, California redwoods, these giant trees, they only live in this really specific region of the planet, in um, the coastal region of California. These coastal redwoods, you don't find them anywhere else. So the species distribution of coastal redwoods is on the uh, Californian coast. That's it. So plate tectonics... Um, actually do have to do with they help us describe species distribution. So there's this really cool fungus to the right here in the bottom right, Mycena interrupta and you find this um, this species of mushroom in the southern tip of South America, in the southern tip of Africa and across Australia. So they did some really cool research on this fungus and using genetic techniques you can actually see um, and predict when this species actually came into existence and it happened to be around um, this, this period when the earth did not look like it does now. So 200 million years ago during the Triassic period, there was just two major supercontinents. You have Laurasia up in the north and then Gondwana in the south. So using this genetic technique, they found out that this, the ancestors of this species came into existence during the Triassic. And they predict that the fungus this mushroom actually only lived in this region. So this region was totally different than what it is today. It was this subtropical, warmer region. And the species distribution of the ancestor of this mushroom lived here. Now, nowadays, you have this fungus growing where it originated from. So as these uh, as these plates actually broke up after Gondwana actually broke up into the present day layout of the planet, this particular species just shows up on where it originated from. So even though, you know, Australia is out in the middle of nowhere and South, the, the southern tip of South America is nowhere near the southern tip of Africa, you have the same exact species showing up in these disjunct 
places because it originated when Gondwana was together. So plate tectonics actually helps describe species distribution if you know what you're looking for with the help of science. Um, you can actually describe species distribution, you, species distribution using plate tectonics. Um, additionally, we have the alteration of climate over extremely long periods. So um, because of plate tectonics, you have different land formations that show up. For example, the Himalayas, they interact with the environment. They don't allow moisture to actually traverse that chain of mountains because it's so tall. So beyond the Himalayas, you have a desert known as the Gobi Desert. I believe we'll get into that um, in a little bit. So I don't wanna to go too much into that, but I just want you guys to know that over extremely long periods of time, plate tectonics can actually alter the climate. So let's get into uh, volcanic activity. So contrary to what many people believe a volcano is, a volcano is just a rupture in the crust of, the, of a planet that allows the products held within magma chambers to escape. So although when you hear the word volcano, you think of this picture behind me here of Volcan Arenal, this mountain looking structure which is clearly a volcano, but a volcano is simply the opening. So actually within the structure of this volcano, there is an opening right at the surface level. So just picture, if you look at my mouse, there is an opening in the earth's crust that's like in here. Now that is actually the volcano. This is just the products of multiple eruptions um, over millions of years that eventually creates this structure that we know as a volcano but actually the volcano is just an opening in earth's crust that releases energy um, a really good thing about volcanoes is that they release nutrients so phosphorus is a limiting nutrient there's only so much phosphorus on the planet we can't synthesize phosphorus. We have to go and when we um, try and make fertilizers for our crops, we can't just chemically make phosphorus. We have to find it. We have to mine for it. Um, we go and use animal byproducts that have phosphorus already in it. Um, one way the earth actually gets more phosphorus is volcanic eruptions because phosphorus is usually found deep in Earth's crust and even in the mantle and with an eruption you get these um, these phosphorus pools entering the um, terrestrial habitat. You guys know that large eruptions can, decim de can totally decimate nearby ecosystems. A good eruption will absolutely obliterate um, an ecosystem and that ecosystem will basically have to start from scratch. Sometimes the entire ecosystem, even on the microbial level, is totally um, sterilized. So you have to wait for the succession of other species to build back that ecosystem to its previous state. Um, active long enough, uh, ocean volcanoes, we don't really think about oceanic volcanoes a lot, but most and many of Earth's volcanoes are actually underwater. If they're active long enough, they'll actually rise above the sea and create new land. So this leads us into the formation of Central America. So um, the formation of Central America, these Oceanic structures actually created land above the ocean 60 million years ago. So far before that, this chain of volcanoes from, uh, from North America to South America, this green region 
was just this chain of volcanoes that erupted and kept erupting and remained active for millions of years. 60 million years ago, it actually popped out of the ocean and created this land bridge between these two continents. So I love that idea. And that's another reason why this region, Central America, is such a species-rich um, area of the world. This region must be protected um, from human interactions because it is vital for an incredible array of species. 60 million years ago, we had this massive migration of animals and plants and fungi um, that moved south from North America and then as well all these different animals, plants and fungi that moved north from South America. So here in South America you have all this competition, all these different species competing for this new phosphorus rich land and that's why uh, that's a main reason why these this area is such a biodiverse rich place. Supervolcanoes are on a totally different level. So these supervolcanoes, um, one thing that's a little airy is that you don't see that like mountain formation. Um, for example, this region in Yellowstone to the right is actually a caldera of a super volcano. So this, you know, is several acres of that's sitting on top of an active volcano. So you can see um, on the picture of the left, what we're looking at um, on the right is this central caldera region. And specifically this super volcano in Yellowstone National Park, it has a stupid amount of magma that is held within the magma chambers below. Apparently, you can fill the Grand Canyon to the rim. Brim? Rim? Same thing? You can fill the Grand Canyon with magma to the brim 11 times. The entire Grand Canyon filled to the brim 11 times with the amount of magma held in this supervolcano in Yellowstone. So an absolutely stupid amount of energy is held within there. And apparently it is overdue for an eruption. So honestly, 2020, it's been one heck of a year. Wouldn't be surprised if a supervolcano went out. It would change the climate um, of Earth, definitely. Um, we would probably have a, maybe, uh, especially in the United States, we'd probably have a nuclear winter. There'd be so much ash in the year, in the air, in the atmosphere, that um, it would be hard to grow crops and it would be cold because this ash would actually block out the sun, um, which is crazy. So watch out for those super volcanoes. So moving on to air currents, um, air currents also drive many um, interactions that have to do with environmental biology. Air currents, they drive much of the precipitation patterns that we see. And as you know, the amount of rain limits what organisms can live in those positions. So we're gonna learn about this specific um, air current interaction known as the Coriolis effect. So the Coriolis force is due to the earth actually spinning. Because the earth actually spins, you get these um, isobars and this, uh, this pressure gradient that takes, actually if you look at this figure on the right, it, it takes air, it takes moist air, it takes the moisture from the tropics, 
So the tropics are right here, these two lines. We have the equator right in the middle. It takes moisture, it takes just the air from the tropics and moves it to the equator from both uh, the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. This Coriolis effect actually removes moisture from the tropics and it makes a very moist equator. So regions along the equator not only have the most intense sunlight, but actually have um, a ridiculous amount of precipitation throughout the year. We could think air currents and, and this Coriolis effect. So I really like this GIF and you could see that not only air currents but because of the Earth's tilt we have this shift in precipitation throughout the year. The, um, the darker colors are um, more wet regions. The white regions are actually deserts. So it's really cool. You can see um, I really love gifts like this. You can see in Africa the largest non-polar desert on the planet, the Sahara. Look, you can basically fit our country in the Sahara Desert. The Sahara Desert is absolutely massive, but each year you get this encroachment of precipitation. And then with that, you can understand you have all these grazers, you have all these animals that are eating grass that have these really long migrations kind of following the precipitation due to um, the air currents, the Coriolis effect, and as well as Earth's tilt. So a lot of interesting ideas going on there. In addition to air currents, we have ocean currents that drive you know, temperature and precipitation patterns from around the world. So with ocean currents, you have breaking waves, you have wind, the Coriolis effect, temperature and salinity differences, um, gravitational pull of the moon changes, ocean currents. And with these different ocean currents, you have um, algal blooms showing up around the planet in certain times of the year in certain positions and those two also drive the migration of many aquatic organisms. Whales, for example, go through crazy long migrations to get to these regions that have these yearly blooms of algae and plankton so they can eat and so they can reproduce um, efficiently. So ocean currents as well as air currents, they drive um, many interactions that have to do with the environment. One ocean current that I really want you guys to understand um, is El Nino in La Nina. So this video link, um, I'm not going to click it now because it's not my video, but I will put this link um, underneath this video. Go watch this video. It's really, really cool to um, understand what's actually going on near the equator um, in South America as well as Indonesia. So, in a, I'm gonna go over this really, really briefly again. Definitely click this link on the bottom of this video because it really helped me understand what's going on. So in the middle is your standard equilateral ocean. This is the Pacific Ocean. This is South America. This is Indonesia. Um, you have Thailand over here, right? So this is Indonesia and South America. When the ocean currents are just average, you have trade winds, that push this uh, warmer, moist air towards Indonesia. Now, in an El Nino year, look at these white, uh, these white arrows. This is an El Nino year. There are no more trade winds, right? The trade winds are much weaker, 
which allow this part of the ocean, which is warm, right? So it actually has to do with driving the warm water. And when the warm water shifts more centrally, the uh, warm air and the precipitation associated with that warm water moves more centrally and you have more flooding um, near central, or I'm sorry, yeah, well, Central and South America, right? So in an El Nino year, you get more flooding across South America. And guess what? You get droughts across Indonesia and India. La Nina, sometimes El Nino reverses into what is called La Nina, and La Nina has an increase of trade winds, um, and the trade winds actually push the warm, wet water and the wet weather patterns basically right on top of Indonesia. You have serious flooding over here, and over here you have droughts, right? So we have to know the difference between El Nino and La Nina. Now, it's really crazy. Um, obviously, there is, you know, people's health at risk. Um, obviously, when it's when your area is being flooded, you're going to have more diseases. You're going to have more mosquitoes, um, and you're going to have, you know, on the opposite side of the spectrum, when there's a drought, right? For in Indonesia during El Nino, when there's a drought, you're obviously not going to have the best crops um, growing and vice versa with South America over here. I know that during El Nino, even though water and um, you know fresh water rains on South America, many of the fisheries, people that depend on fish, specifically sardines, um, they cannot catch Sardines. So this warm water actually um, it reduces the food, and um, it's just not the optimal temperature for sardines. There are many sardines that just come belly up during El Nino years. The water is too warm, and you have socioeconomic um, hardships along these coastal regions that depend on these sardine fisheries. So um, there's that little additional information. Again, environmental biology, obviously there's these underlying themes, but I'm going to try and tie this human aspect to it. pH, we're going to talk about pH a lot, especially with ocean acidification, but pH stands for the potential of hydrogen. So it's a numeric scale used to specify how acidic or basic an aqueous solution is. Um, although some life has evolved to live in pH extremes, pH most certainly does limit biodiversity. So for example, if a freshwater region gets polluted and the uh, it becomes more acidic, which on the pH scale, if the pH goes down, it becomes more acidic. So if the pH goes down in a freshwater system, you're going to change the biota. You're going to change uh, everything from the bottom up. You're going to change what plants grow there. You're going to change what animals can live there. And many times, simple alterations of pH have a long-lasting negative effect on that system. I mentioned ocean acidification. That's a huge problem humans and other species are facing in this modern era. Um, just wanted to introduce pH. Again, take a look at this scale. Our blood is relatively um, neutral. It is slightly basic. Um, it's You've heard of um, eating an alkaline diet to stay healthy. So um, a lot of different meats when you eat too much meat, your the, your blood actually gets really acidic, and your body, when it's more acidic, is actually more prone to getting cancer. Um, so 
you've heard of eating a lot of leafy greens. Those leafy greens are alkaline. They help balance your pH. They help make you a little bit more basic, which is much healthier um, to be. Contrary to what you might think, like a lemon, for example, is already at a, a pH of two, like lemon juice and vinegar. And interestingly enough, when you eat an acid like lemon, that actually doesn't reduce, it doesn't make your, uh, your body more acidic. So your body actually deals with this acidity and um, it doesn't actually af affect your pH. It's interesting that, it, it's interesting to me what foods do make your body more acidic, but acids like citrus actually do not, which is interesting. So the next thing we're gonna learn about is the electromagnetic spectrum which is the range of frequencies of electromagnetic radiation in their respective wavelengths. So every single thing that you can see is within this tiny little region known as the visible spectrum. All the colors that you see have their own frequency associated with them. The longer wavelength frequencies are red, um, the shorter the frequency, um, the shortest frequencies are in the violet spectrum, in between frequencies that comprise of orange, yellow, green um, spectrum. So everything you see is within this tiny little visible spectrum. Past to the right, as you get finer and finer frequencies, no longer can you see these wavelengths, right? And you can see the ultraviolet radiation. You guys have heard of UV rays. So the sun is actually releasing, the sun is actually releasing the entire uh, electromagnetic spectrum, right? Many celestial objects release uh, different wavelengths. Uh, many of these wavelengths all at once. You guys know that sunscreen is vital to our health because it actually blocks out ultraviolet radiation. So we're gonna get this, we're gonna get um, to this in just a little bit, but we can't see ultraviolet radiation just like we can't see microwaves cooking our food in a microwave, right? But there are these these frequencies of energy that interact with the environment in really important ways. So this is a nice segue into the ozone. So the ozone is this layer in Earth's atmosphere that has a heavy concentration of O3 molecules. So O3 is actually known as ozone. Ozone is O3. So that means if you take a look at the right of its atomic composition you have just three oxygen molecules that are bonded together now these molecules they are not stable so they basically this layer of the ozone in earth's atmosphere that um, peaks at around 20 21 kilometers up in our atmosphere has all these oxygen molecules and it's, this area is being bombarded with radiation, which is this radiation's hitting these oxygen molecules. It's making them fly around really fast. They collide. Uh, rogue oxygen molecules are colliding with O2 molecules and they form O3. And then UV radiation will hit an O3 molecule. It'll cause uh, the O3 molecule to break up into O2 and another rogue oxygen so the ozone is this really dynamic layer and it actually filters out if you look at this figure it filters out much of the radiation coming down from the sun so actually the most harmful form of radiation is uvc radiation and it gets almost completely well it does get completely filtered out with the earth's ozone UVB and UVA are less harmful. They still are harmful, 
but they do get filtered out um, through the ozone, but still a, uh, a bit of that radiation does reach the Earth's surface. This is why it's important to wear sunscreen to protect yourself from this UV, this ultraviolet radiation that the sun is emitting. With this being said, um, this is not only harmful to us, but it's harmful to other organisms. Now, other organisms um, that are even similar to us, they don't need sunscreen because they're going to be covered in fur. So other mammals are totally covered in fur. Birds are covered in feathers that can reflect this UV radiation. With our own evolution, and I'm going to get into human evolution, um, we have lost much of our hair and fur, so our skin is bare, our skin um, is vulnerable to UV radiation, um, which is really, really uh, interesting. Something that's really cool, a little bit of a side story here, is that if you um, are interested in studying scorpions, um, you can go to a desert at night. Obviously, there's not a lot of scorpions around here. Um, but if you go to a desert and in the nighttime, you take actually a UV lamp, this ultraviolet, like purple lamp, and shine your surroundings, a scorpion will actually be like illuminated. It'll, it'll, it'll glow orange. That's because scorpions reflect ultraviolet radiation. So they don't need sunscreen because their actual exoskeleton, it protects them from ultraviolet radiation, which is really, really cool. Um, and that allows us to find scorpions in the nighttime. Now, another little interesting fact about scorpions is that they're one of the oldest terrestrial lineages, lineages on the planet. They are known, uh, they're, there's this group of species called the Chelicerata, and they are um, one of the first organisms, the first groups of organisms to actually crawl out of the ocean and actually start to live a terrestrial life. So interestingly enough, they crawled out of the ocean, their ancestors crawled out of the ocean when there was no ozone. So without an ozone, individuals actually needed to have protection against ultraviolet radiation. This characteristic has been maintained throughout time, which is why this exoskeleton glows orange when you take a UV lamp in a desert. Photosynthesis is the process that converts light energy into chemical energy. Now this isn't, you know, a botany class, so I don't necessarily want you to know the equation above, but you should know the, uh, the products and the outcome of photosynthesis. So what goes into photosynthesis? Carbon dioxide, water, and light. And what comes out of photosynthesis is sugar and water, right? Now, you have to know two macronutrients. So macronutrients are nutrients an organism requires on a large scale. There are micronutrients that we all need, that we need in small doses, but we too require macronutrients. Plants, the two main macronutrients you should know about, one of them we already talked about, phosphorus. Phosphorus, again, is in, uh, it's in limited quantities and is limited to the actual element, right? Phosphorus is, uh, the most of Earth's phosphorus is hidden deep within the mantle, right? So this is a limiting macronutrient. And then we have nitrogen. So nitrogen and phosphorus are the two macronutrients that plants need um, a lot of to actually carry out photosynthesis. Without nitrogen and phosphorus, these plants can't create the structures that actually capture light and um, create the chain 
of reactions that allow sugar to be synthesized. So those are two uh, main uh, macronutrients that these that these organisms require. Additionally, something interesting about plants: most plants are green, right? So if I were to ask you, what part of the visible spectrum do plants use? You might say green because they're green. So if we take a look at this visible visible spectrum figure yet again, plants are green. So one would think that they use this spectrum, but that actually is not the case. Plants actually use the um, the higher frequencies of the blue and violet and the lower frequencies of the red, orange, and sometimes yellow. So because they're not using this, their pigment chlorophyll is actually reflecting the parts of the spectrum it is not using, which is really interesting and it changes the way I look at nature. Because you see a color and you think that that object is that color but actually what you're seeing is that object reflecting parts of the spectrum that it's not absorbing so plants do not use this green portion of the visible spectrum they're reflecting it they're not utilizing it so that's why we see green leaves so there are all these different organisms on our planet and with those organisms, they have evolved different methods to acquire energy. So this is going to be on future quizzes and tests throughout the rest of the year because it's so easy to come up with multiple choice questions that have to do with this. So we, humans, and almost every other animal are heterotrophic organisms. More specifically, we are chemoheterotrophs, meaning that we use chemicals to break down um, larger organic molecules into simple sugars. Heterotrophic, we're heterotrophic. More specific, specifically, we are chemoheterotrophic. There is one organism, one animal, that we've recently found that changes this. Before the discovery of this oriental hornet, every animal was a chemoheterotroph. We had to create a new category for this animal that was just found within the last 15 years. So looking at this oriental hornet, scientists, they uh, we're wondering what this yellow patch was on the head of the oriental hornet. It turns out that it is actually synthesizing glucose um, like a solar panel. Like it's creating chemical energy using the sun. It also eats though, which is why it is still heterotrophic. Um, but it is, this has a new category, it's photoheterotrophic, photoheterotrophic. So it still uses chemicals to break down larger organic molecules into glucose, glucose but it also utilizes this solar panel-like um, organ to synthesize um, more glucose. So really interesting oriental hornet. Who knows, man? Like, that is just crazy to me. Um, another heterotrophic organism are mushrooms. So fungi are actually, contrary to what many people believe, fungi are closer related to animals and us than they are to plants. So fungi, although they look different and although they do not move, they stay in one position like a plant does, they 
eat in a similar way. So we eat by chewing food and swallowing that food and having chemicals um, released and uh, kind of break down our food within our bodies and breaking down these organic molecules into smaller and smaller parts and then our you know our system can then sequester the nutrients from our food similar to that fungi they break down their food outside of their body so here's a fungus right here again they have these root like structures called hyphae a network of hyphae is called mycelia the mycelial network pumps out basically gastric its gastric liquid to digest its surrounding and then it soaks up that slurry and it it um, can then form different structures using those nutrients that's how it gets energy it's still heterotrophic it's still chemo heterotrophic um, just like us just in a different manner moving on to autotrophic organisms auto or self feeding right trophic um, refers to feeding and food always in biology and auto is you know self so these self feeding organisms they actually synthesize glucose themselves um, a photo autotroph is a plant so a plant it creates its own glucose again we just looked at the photosynthesis slide it's as simple as that it is a self feeder photo obviously relates to the sunlight that it uses in this chemical reaction um, that's vital to get uh, the cycle going uh, for plants to create their own glucose a chemo autotroph um, you can find these organisms in places void of light so without light organisms uh, through millions of years figured out a way to access energy not using light because there's no light so in deep sea vents there are these bacteria that are chemo autotrophs so instead of using light they actually use heat to synthesize their own glucose so instead of light they use heat and with that heat they chemically synthesize glucose and without these uh, chemo autotrophs in deep sea vents uh, or near deep sea vents you wouldn't have these ecosystems that could survive near these deep sea vents so these systems are actually thriving because there's an organism that can synthesize sugars in areas void of light so if we take a look at this bottom right picture i really really like this picture i took so this is at my parents house my parents have a norway maple it's a, a maple that is obviously um, indigenous to norway and every year it would get these black spots actually around this time of year the beginning of September you would see these black spots um, starting to form on these maple trees I did a little bit of research back in the day and I found out that this was actually a fungus this is a parasitic fungus known as the tar spot fungus that parasitizes the leaf tissue of different maple plants so what we're looking at I love this picture and I love this picture on this slide because you have a heterotrophic organism this fungus is actually eating and digesting the sugars and the um, the organic compounds made in this leaf so in one picture you have a chemo heterotroph this fungus and a photo autotroph this plant actually photosynthesizing right so I really like that picture last but not least we have 
this idea of feedback. So feedbacks, especially positive feedback, are another very important underlying theme of this semester. We're gonna know the difference and a really great example of a positive feedback. So the example I'm using has to do with Earth's reflectivity and its relationship with temperature. So a great example of a positive feedback has to do with Earth's albedo. So albedo is the reflectivity of a celestial object. If the moon had a low albedo, it would be hard to see. But we know because of Earth's surface, it reflects light pretty amazingly. And that's why the, the, the moon is so bright because the Earth has a lot of albedo. It has a high amount of albedo. Interestingly enough, ice and snow has a lot of albedo. So it reflects a lot of light. Um, as the planet is warming up though, more and more of this ice and snow is melting and it's actually revealing darker earth that has low albedo. So you can see over here guys, um, in this band of light that's coming from the sun, as it hits the darker earth, much of that energy is actually being absorbed and transformed into heat, and there is not a lot of light reflecting off of it. Oppositely, when this beam of light hits the snow and ice, much of it is actually reflected back into the atmosphere and out of space. Like it'll come in the atmosphere and it can actually bounce off a surface and go back into space. But if it hits a dark surface uh, with low albedo, that light actually turns into heat. And this actually causes the positive feedback we are talking about. So with more light being transformed into heat with the, uh, with the reveal of more lower albedo surfaces like dark soil and earth, the planet will heat up, more ice will melt, revealing more dark uh, surfaces with low albedo, which again, it causes this positive feedback. So the term positive doesn't mean like good, like yay, positive, no. Positive just refers to this type of feedback. A positive feedback is like a snowball effect. So as a planet heats up, more and more ice is melting, revealing lower albedo surfaces, making the planet heat up more, making more ice melt. You can see the snowball effect this is a positive feedback. A negative feedback, oppositely, is more of a balancing act. So a great example of a negative feedback has to do with our own homeostasis. Our bodies, they need to stay in a specific region, both temperature, chemically, pH, you name it. We have a narrow niche in our bodies that our body tries to maintain and insulin is a great example of this so after you and i eat our blood sugar our blood sugar increases as our blood sugar increases our endocrine our endocrine uh, system realizes this and releases a product known as insulin insulin lowers your blood sugar which maintains homeostasis within our bodies. If you know someone with diabetes, their blood sugar is either, you know, their blood sugar doesn't stay in homeostasis on its own, right? They might be producing too much insulin, they might be producing not enough insulin, so they have to test their blood and give themselves the appropriate amount of insulin to maintain homeostasis, right? So homeostasis is like a balancing 
uh, I mean, sorry, a negative feedback is like a balancing act, right? So you have the increase in blood sugar after you eat. This increase causes more insulin to be released, which decreases your blood sugar. As your blood sugar goes down, less insulin is released. So it's this balancing act. Positive feedback, not a balancing act. Positive feedback is more of a runaway interaction, like a snowball effect. Cool. So that was the last slide. Thank you guys so much for your attention. If you need me to explain a specific slide, uh, maybe a little bit better, maybe a little bit more clear, just shoot me an email. Um, thank you for your attention. Stay up to date with these videos. Look at uh, Blackboard for your homework calendar. Make sure you're not missing assignments. You definitely should have your McGraw-Hill Connect code by now and you should definitely be um, knocking away at these homeworks for September. Thank you again for your attention and I will catch you on the next video.